Stephanie Bordeaux, as um, some of you uh, might know me. Uh, I am a part of Racing Magpie here in Mini Luzaha Otuawahe. And um, I'm just really excited to welcome you all here um, to be a part of this presentation. Hi, Uncle John. Looks like you're at Racing Magpie. Um, I'm calling in from my home office. But um, so for those of you that don't know, Racing Magpie is a Lakota-centric arts and cultural organization here in Rapid City, South Dakota, that centers the Lakota practice of being a good relative in everything that one does. Our work is focused on elevating and amplifying the ongoing work of community-based artists and culture bearers. So um, for, as you can see, my Uncle John is in his studio at Racing Magpie. So we think as part of being a good relative, um, this programming winter camp is reimagining these models of problem solving and community building in the present day world. And we do this by examining the deeper cultural roots that we have as Lakota and Ocheti Shakoan people in the way that we do things, how we interact with the universe around them, around us and around the artists and culture bearers that we work with. Um, and these events, you know, our virtual presentations are open to the public, but we really try to target Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota community members as both presenters and attendees. Uh, we want to thank the Bush Foundation for their generous sponsorship of this program. Um, and if you want to know how you could support Racing My Pie further, you can make a donation through our website, our mailing in or dropping off a donation. Um, also, if you get a chance and you're in the Rapid City area, um, Racing Magpie has a brand new space um, in the Robbinsdale area, so we would also love to see you stop by and visit. And then, of course, you can always support our artists and creatives and cultural practitioners um, by searching them out, by buying their art, downloading their music, um, and supporting um, their creative processes. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, you can drop it in the chat. If you're watching um, through Facebook Live, um, you can drop a, a comment on the video. I will be monitoring both the chat and um, Facebook Live if we have any questions. If you would, we encourage you to keep your cameras on, but of course, um, we're, we're two years deep into this pandemic and I know some people have some Zoom fatigue. So if you wanna keep your camera off, that's also okay with us. Um, so without further delay, I would like to introduce Vicki Eagle. Um, Vicki is a Sichungo Lakota tribal member and is also half Japanese. She grew up in Denver, Colorado. She's currently a third year PhD student um, at the University of California in the Department of Anthropology. Um, her subfield in anthropology are social anthropology and American Indian studies. She's a, she is also a freelance anthropologist. Um, freelance, sorry, hold on. My phone was ringing, it got me distracted. <laughs> She's a freelance photographer, not a freelance anthropologist. She's a freelance uh, photographer that is drawn to understanding the intersections of multiple native identities and the experience of their everyday life. Her values in being culturally responsible as a photographer and her creative is to create positive images and voices of our communities that we don't often see. She has spent a decade um, photographing her life as a contemporary Native American photographer with her project called Real Life Indian. Uh, this project is rooted in a community-based approach and her artistic style um, is very much in the photojournalistic and portrait um, framework. So her current work is focused on photography, photographing Native American heavy metal bands in a genre called res metal, um, which she's really focusing in the Southwest Four Corners area. Um, she sees her project as speaking to Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen Z Native youth, and their passion for music and the arts. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Vicki. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction, Clementine. That pretty much says everything 
I don't have to present anymore. Just kidding. Mitaki api, Vicky Eagle, Imachi api, Si Chungu Oyanke, Matahan, Chante Washte Nape, Chizape. My name is Vicky Eagle. I'm from the um, Si Chungu Lakota Nation. I am currently um, a third year. Oh, and I extend a warm handshake to you all. Just wanted to at least greet everybody that's out there. It's nice to be. Um, even though virtually um, talking to Lakota Dakota youth out there, it's um, exciting to just, I guess, take this moment to also talk about my work and kind of what I do and how um, I can just bring it all, I guess, like together into one presentation. So I am going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, let me get this going here. I haven't done a presentation in a while, so please excuse me as I will <laughs> be like kind of experimenting at the same time trying to put everything together. Um, so this is my first slide. I also do beadwork. I'm also at the Native Sakura on Instagram. Um, this is another platform that I use for my beading skills where I try to blend um, being a Japanese and Lakota person um, and trying to create new beadwork that even Clementine's wearing, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, and um, merge these things together. So art has always been an outlet for me to express, I think, my identities, my cultures, and my creativity. Oops. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I am currently a third year UCLA PhD student. I want to take this time to acknowledge that um, UCLA is on the Gabriela Tongva land and that they see the Gabriela Tongva as the traditional land caretakers of Tongvagar on the LA Basin and Southern Channel Islands. Um, I've been really grateful to be back in Los Angeles to finish my coursework and to also um, be here to um, yeah, further my studies um, and kind of like have this adventure. So this is um, just a land acknowledgement I wanted to do briefly. Um, so yeah, Clementine said everything about who I am. Um, I will be presenting on my photography today. Um, I have bicultural identities, how I've used photography to come to understand myself and how I've also been using it as a healing and reflecting activity. Um, and then just to also know that like there are a lot of us that are bicultural within our native communities, even Lakota communities that also have different expressions and ways of looking at the world. And that's something that I've always been passionate about wanting to understand um, and within identity work. So I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I grew up very urban and trying to navigate a lot of, um, I think, cultural identities of being who I am, both as a Lakota and as a Japanese person, um, kind of like being a mixed race has been something very important to me. Um, what most people don't know, I was actually born in Deadwood, um, South Dakota, so I was born in the Black Hills and spent my childhood until I was like four or five, like really early childhood um, in South Dakota before moving to Denver. But I always found myself going back to South Dakota frequently. Um, I've taught at Red Cloud um, as a photo teacher, photo multimedia teacher for one year. I was also a bus driver during that time and also took kids home after school, after teaching and also found myself um, visiting multiple times, working with students who come to schools or to universities or who move um, kind of like back and forth. So I've always been interested in, I think, this relationship that I have had, um, et cetera. So um, how I've used and started my work and identities was actually going through my family photos. And there was a time where I was an undergrad. So I attended the University of Denver and took a photography class and kind of wanted to formulate what it meant to be, I guess, me, right? Vicky Eagle, who is half Japanese, always telling people, um, even at the Native American centers, the Indian centers in Denver, most of the time my mom would bring me there. My mom's Japanese. So having to like, you know, navigate that I could receive like resources and help, you know, from the Indian communities by being enrolled at the same time being raised by a Japanese mother. So these photographs, you know, I kind of wanted to do a personal histories of my family and their culture. So on the, um, the left is my grandmother and my grandfather um, in Japan. This is their wedding photo. So they were married post-World War II. And they actually didn't have a traditional Japanese wedding while well, they are wearing traditional like kimono and like wearing traditional um, clothing. This is actually not the most formal 
um, wedding photo because it was considered a time to not like to not be in celebration because of World War II, post World War II reconstruction, everything that it was considered to just have like a more humble like wedding in that sense. Um, and that also ties to like kind of the history of like, you know, my grandfather, who's also a World War II veteran and kind of like how all these like worlds, timelines, cultures kind of come together. But on the right is a picture of my great grandfather, Moses Big Eagle and um, Winifred Larvey, my great grandmother, yeah, great grandmother. And um, when I kind of found all these photographs together, I kind of wanted to explore how I can use family photos that you have as your own projects at home and how to make like even these forms of photography isn't just about going out, taking photographs, taking pictures. It's also about collecting photographs and kind of piecing a timeline and story together. So uh, my mother is from Tokushima Prefecture, which is Tokushima, Japan. And this is the time where I kind of grew up in this interesting place where I was raised as a daughter of an immigrant, right? So there are times my mother didn't have citizenship growing up. I didn't understand voting. I didn't understand um, certain things that my mom couldn't participate in because of the citizenship, um, because she was just as a green card, like permanent resident but not citizenship. So I kind of grew up um, even being put into ESL, like English as a second language, because I just assumed that, you know, I spoke Japanese, I didn't speak English, that, you know, um, that this is just my background. So this is kind of like the photographs of like growing up. This is my mother at 17 years old in front of uh, Mount Fuji. Um, and just wanted to yeah, just show kind of this timeline that at this point, my mother has lived in the United States longer. Um, than in her home, her mother country in Japan. So that's also been like this new dynamic that I've also been looking to kind of talk about. And this idea that I spend a lot of time on is what does it mean to coming home? So that idea of home um, is something here that I talk about. This one's like our first home in Denver, where we settled and where we um, where I was raised, this one's like where my mother's country is from, and this is where my grandfather um, lived until he retired, and this idea of like visiting, um, my, my grandfather lived in Cherry Creek for a very long time, so this idea of what coming home meant, and this idea of what it meant to visit two places um, has been something that I've always photographed, talked about, try to figure out how um, someone like me can understand what it means to live in two places. Um, and to have an affinity to multiple places in that way. So that's why I take pictures of buildings, um, homes, things like that, that are like significant. Um, something that I also do that I always tell people that if you wanna also understand yourself too, is to also look at self-portraiture um, and self-work and how self-portraits come to help you understand how you express yourself every day and how you navigate in this world. So, you know, these are self-portraits I did um, with, of course, help with some friends, but just something that just like lets me be a contemporary person. So something that looks like anime, something that looks like something that I'm working in at this time was working at the University of Denver as a director for Native American programs, but I also have these affinity to Japanese things at the same time and grew up with Miyazaki films, grew up with all of them only in Japanese. I never saw them in, in English until I was a teenager, so I actually never knew um, and you understood what some of it was going on, but for the most part, it like took a while for me to really understand these films. Um, and then this one I did on the very left is I've actually wanted to understand my features a lot of being biracial about being Japanese Lakota to where I kind of split my face and I kind of look at my features because I've always, I've always seen myself as half and I've always seen how my features, my face, everything has always reflected that that would be who I am. And that's how I walk in this world. And that's not something that I can always ignore. And that's something I never do um, is to never like not mention both of my cultures, how I was raised is always something I'm always open about because it really changes and orients the way that I've looked at the world and the way that I understand things is more, it's just different. It's not like whether it's good or bad, it's just different. And that's something that I've always wanted to understand with my thought patterns. Okay. So yeah, during the time where I got to actually study abroad um, in Japan during my third year of undergrad, before then I've only visited Japan to see my family one time. 
um, when I was 13 years old. So going back to study in Japan to learn my mother's own tongue, uh, mother language of Japanese, learn how to read, figure out a whole entire new system and country, I kind of felt like I got to experience her life um, when she came to America and to kind of be as an immigrant with foreign eyes and just like me going back to Japan and kind of this full circle of like, okay, this is where my mother's from. And this is something where I miss a lot, actually. I miss Japan all the time. Um, but this connection that I have to it, right? So learning about what that looks like. Um, so yeah. Okay. So then during that time, I also got to spend time with my host family. And my host family in Japan, um, they gave me something I never had, which was a Japanese childhood, right? So there's always different ceremonies that you get to do as a child, whether that's Sichiji Gosan, which is like, um, yeah, just a ceremony that you get to go to the temple, you get to put on the kimono and you get to like kind of do this, like this prayer, right? Because there are these like years as a child, these three, five and seven, that's considered um, time that you need protection um, for children in particular. So that's why you know, I got to experience some of those cultural ceremonies. I got to experience a life living in the apartments in Japan with two at the time. Well, now they're like in their 20s, which is like, it really weirds me out that it's been that long. Um, but back then they were in elementary school. So they're in third and like fifth grade. Um, and they got to like really show me a life that like was actually, I thought would be really different from my own life, but it wasn't. So like the culture shock of living there was like, oh, this is exactly what I do at home. Um, so it's like, I realized I loved my home life, very Japanese. But then when I went into the outside world, I was very much approached as a native person, especially with my last name being Eagle, my features, my hair being longer, um, whatever other, other reasons. It's like, I kind of experienced both things at once. Okay, so and that in particular, when I mentioned leaving my home, right, so leaving home, I went to the University of Denver, and I was, um, how I started my project was I just looked at how many Native Americans were at the University of, the, of Denver, and they would have like every other university, the diversity slogans of how they're open, inclusive, how they want everyone from different backgrounds to be there. Yet there wasn't a lot of Native people. So I kind of did this project um, that really was like, there's five of us that were like openly, um, I think like openly active about being Native on campus um, at the time. And I think um, the five of us really put, I think our work together to try to make the university a better place and let us like, let people know our presence was there. And this was, undergrad was like in the early, mid 2000s so you know we're talking before land acknowledgements were a thing before you know even looking at histories of the University of Denver which is really tied to the Sand Creek Massacre before even um, Native American centers at least at this university was really just like developing um, this was kind of the environment so I was really frustrated with how white my experience was yeah, I would try to find places where I could make home, where I could make places on campus look like me. And I did that through photographs. So I would take pictures of beaded moccasins with cherry blossom trees that are Japanese, um, try to find ways that, you know, I could just see myself within the university. But it was like being able to use images to create that. Um, and then just also doing that within Denver. So Denver, you know, if folks are familiar with Denver, all the streets going west um, are all Native American tribal like street names. And there's an interesting history with that because, you know, going east, it's all presidents and then going west, it's all tribal nations. And west is also interesting because it is directly, right? Like the roads, everything goes directly to the mountains, which is also like where Western expansion, dispossession and gold rush was like a big thing. And most of the people in Denver don't even know what these street names are and what they mean or how to pronounce them properly. So people like really butcher a lot of these names, not all of them, but a lot of them are really butchered, but people don't think about the relationship of like, land and these tribal names and to Colorado and the displacement, et cetera. So I kind of started looking at, well, where in the cities are we finding ourselves and where we're represented? And that time before murals, before um, I think 
bigger artwork before centers, like other than the American Indian Center, but like something that was visibly at that time in 2010 that I could see myself, it was like their street names going west. Um, so, and then also, of course, like gatherings like Denver March, and I wanted to I find more unique photographs and more unique experiences of Native people that I think were more, um, at the time, you know, 2010, there was a lot of photographs that were coming out of, um, of course, portraits like Curtis, but more in the contemporary time, things like Matika Wilbur, um, Concrete Indians, even Zid Jackson. Um, there's just like a lot of great Native American photographers. I've always experimented, I think, with both looking at contemporary, the ideas of modernity um, and the ideas of like how Natives in photographs could be looked at um, and also taken. And that's something I've always, I'm still formulating because everything's always changing. So what I did 10 years ago, I don't think I would do now, but you know, 10 years ago, it was good for the time that it was in. Um, and because of that, like, I kind of wanted to look at portraiture different of like, okay, well, where are the community of people around me who um, are interacting in these spaces? So whether it's the University of Denver, this is Justine Medina graduating with her master's degree at the time of University of Denver, um, and to put, place them around, I think, just where place and personhood and land and space, right, are all connected together. And that I did at the University of Denver. And then I started to only do white backdrops. Um, I know people thought it was very studio art, in some ways remedial, in some ways mundane. And that's like, honestly, that was the point of my work. It was meant to be not say boring, but it was meant to just be like, we're always putting native people in the background um, with nature. Um, with regalia only with like at that time that's how I felt like I was seeing it um, and that you know we featuredly look native and then we're in our regalia but that's not everyday life and that's why I came out with this idea of real life Indian was supposed to be this very satire sarcastic like tone of like here's a real life Indian that people don't think about um, and then I also got a lot of backlash for my title for Real Life Indian, where people thought it was either cheesy or they thought like, why would you use Indian? We're not Indians, we're not from India. But that was actually the point. It was the point to talk about, well, if that's the case, then yeah, why are we that? And why don't we like talk about like tribal names? Why don't we talk about, um, you know, everything that is Indian, right? So then it's like, if you, especially when you go into federal Indian law, everything is Indian, right? Treaties, everything is signed with Indian. Um, Indian Relocation Act, um, you know, there's things like Indian Health Services, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education. So the purpose of my project with Real Life Indian is with all these things and all these names of Indian, who are these Indians and what is a real life Indian, right? And this idea of like real life Indian isn't wearing a regalia in nature every day. That's like not what we do, you know? Whereas like, I kind of brought my friend Amanda in this project, which this is where Res Metal kind of started in my mind, um, is that when I asked her to like just come for a portrait what do you want to wear she wore her iron maiden t-shirt and she was like we're metal too you know that's what she told me she's like I wore this because we're metal and I kind of thought about it like yeah why aren't we talking about Indian metal heads we're just always like at the time I felt in that era um, this idea of like presenting and performing this performative thing of photographs of being native and like having signature things of being indigenous um, and I liked that her t-shirt for me helped kind of disrupt I think this idea of culture and like what contemporary things are so that's kind of like how I started these backdrops is I wanted to just take out what if you just take out everything in the background and you're just forced to look at native people for who they are and what they're doing um, and how they look every day or how they show up and present themselves so um, that's kind of what I did. And at the time I didn't have a white backdrop. So I used this like other backgrounds at UCLA. Um, one of my adventures also took me there, um, which also led me to like trying to do this like idea of a cubicle series of like, do people show like Indians just working in cubicles and like all the work that goes behind into just like sometimes just sitting doing mundane nine to five things um, that I felt like at the time were always talked about. Um, and if I did see them in a cubicle, they would also be presented in regalia in front of a cubicle. 
Um, but just wanted to show this everyday mundane life of what that looked like, of like my experiences, because I also worked in a cubicle. That was a real thing um, at one point in my life. So, um, yeah. Okay, so as I kind of transition into my life of like, okay, this is my photo project, and I went to move to UCLA for my first job, and I remember I had an Asian American um, doctor who I was like really excited to meet, but then she called me exotic because she asked me what my backgrounds were. And I told her I was Japanese and Lakota. And I was really surprised that someone would call me exotic within the healthcare industry. And then also like how to talk about my mental health, physical health. Um, how do you talk about historical trauma? This idea of a model minority of like being always having to achieve and that's something that I am still working through is like why do I like this idea of achievement and what that looks like where does it end and where does gratification happen as well um, and then just like how do I even talk to a practitioner about my mother's Japanese her English doesn't always translate um, care in the way that I need it to and because Japanese is my second language not my first I still can't communicate I think emotionally at times to my mother in the way that I can in English right and I think there are barriers that I've had in my life um, having to navigate I think the system of having an immigrant parent and those experiences and then also being indigenous being native and at the time feeling isolated and alone a lot but then learning about a spiritual path, our culture, our language, and then how that makes sense to me. And going through that, like receiving mental health was like really helpful. And I would say like photographs really help. So this photograph, I kind of talk about it as my Mad Hatter, where it's like I inside I'm like really confused what I'm doing half the time and like where I am emotionally but on the outside I present that I know what I'm doing um, and where I am in life and where my camera is here um, but yeah that's kind of like something I do want to talk about with mental health because I think it's really important um, to just be open about it so at the time um, last year I started this project because it was about um, I mean, it was during COVID and there was a lot emotionally happening, um, both with COVID, how it was affecting Native reservations, like yeah, affecting Native communities, right? The global pandemic in particularly were vulnerable. And then at the same time, the amount of anti-Asian hate that was happening and how my mother was also navigating that because she would tell me that people at the grocery store would give her like 10 feet social distance or they looked at her like she was a virus itself. And that really surprised me because she's never, my mom sometimes has a hard time with understanding how racism works, especially when it comes to her. And I think that was the first time where she's like, people are really avoiding me in Denver or are being extra cautious around me. And that kind of worried me a lot. And I ended up coming back to Denver just to like figure out what was happening or just to be, just to be like, in relation to my mother to be in that area but then it was like I was navigating these two things where I'm looking at the news where I see our tribal communities are being really affected and to see the amount of loss and grief in our communities especially with language learners and the fear of that at the time the beginning and then to see um, at the time when the Asian women that were murdered um, in Atlanta Georgia and the shooter was considered to have a bad day and I just like really lost it. I think after that, I was just so upset because this was like months and months, right? Of like looking at these things, looking at how Asian Americans were targeted, looking how native people have been just on the news for just like detrimental, right? Like states of like what COVID was happening. So I did this project to help my emotions and to also just say like, you know, there's us out here that are navigating two spaces of COVID right now in these like identities. Um, so I look at, was looking at like how Native women are experiencing violence, how um, Asian women are always seen as this gaze of being sexually commodified, um, that white male terrorists will be known as having a bad day. And to see, I think these things two come together, right, in one and how I navigated that and understood that and just like had all these feelings at the time for that. Um, this is kind of what I meant with the amount of COVID, um, the amount of 
uh, 33,000, sorry, not 3,800, well, 3,800, yeah, anti-Asian hate um, cases have been reported, but that wasn't the ones that were unreported, and I had a lot of fear at the time, especially for my mother, but she was like, I'll be okay, I wear, like, my mother would wear a hat and sunglasses, and then she would also wear a mask, and I just thought, why do you, we were wearing a lot of layers, but that was just, because she said, no one can tell what I am, right, and that kind of, like, stood out to me a lot during that time, um, and then how I was like experiencing it was just like, like every exhausted, I think grad student indoors, you know, we're just looking at social media and in our thoughts. So I wanted to do something to help, I think, be creative in that way. And so I found, um, I have a few folks in the Denver area that are Asian native who are, um, their parents are half, are Vietnamese, so they're half Vietnamese. They're actually Sichangu Lakota and they're Diné. Um, and they're also powwow dancers too. And how they also talk about like what it's like being Asian is like they're Vietnamese, they come home, they're Buddhist at home, but when they go out, you know, they're at powwows, they're at, you know, volunteering for the community. We're still in relation with all of our relatives, you know, in both places. Um, and kind of did this project looking at that. Um, I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit just so I can get to the Q and A's. Um, these are all on my Instagram and um, just look, yeah, just wanting to also like, I found a lot of Asian natives like because of this project. And that was like really exciting um, for me to meet other native people that are also like their parents are from either Asia or they're Asian American and to talk about like, I never thought like a lot of messages I received was I never thought I saw someone like me or knew there was someone like me out there. Or there was like one or two of us. Right. And that's always a thing in the community. I'm like, at least there's one or two of us out there. But then other people were like coming to my page, wanting to follow other people that I identified as Asian native um, and had these experiences of like navigating um, or just experiencing cultures in general, like experiencing like our Asian food and experiencing our native culture at the same time. Um, so if, you, if yeah. you want to go over a little bit, that's okay too. We can go oh, okay. past the hour. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Clementine. Yeah. I try to, yeah, I try to be like cognizant of time too, but yeah, thank you for that. I know we started a little bit late. So, um, yeah, and I think a lot of our patterns are very similar. You know, we were labeled either exotic or, you know, our features were always looked at. What does it mean to be half and having to feel like you have to perform or have to prove or have to seek validation? And I think those are, those are I think, all are really important conversations to have. Um, but to also just like, I think, look at how these things are not negative, right? So, you know, hafu is a very Japanese term that you're always hafu, like Vicky's hafu is a lot that I would get even living in Japan. They would say, oh, your mother's Japanese, you're hafu. Um, and that was always very clear, like you're half, right? And this idea of like, does it mean that you're half a person or that you're half a like human being, you're not complete? And for me, and especially with like native identities and our ideas of blood quantum politics and fractioning our existence and putting us in a fraction, like none of that matters, right? When we're part of the Oyate, we're part of like being who we are with each other in relation and how we're related to each other and how we act in that way and see ourselves, right? And in those ways, we're just together. But for being Asian, I try to also say hafu is not something to be ashamed of either or about being less, right? Hafu is a different reality. And I think that that's okay to actually own up to that. And this is just me personally. Some other people I think really don't like the term hafu and have like a lot of like, there's a lot of pain and stigma with that term. And I completely understand that too. But for me, I think reclaiming this idea of hafu is I actually grew up with two cultures and I am not like a full Japanese person either because I grew up in two different cultures. I grew up going to powwow. I grew up going to ceremony. I grew up learning about ceremony, learning language and learning two different cultures and two different languages. And that my experience is so unique and so different but that, that's beautiful in itself. Um, so that's kind of like how I use photography, how I use, I think, all these conversations to say, these are all of our lived experiences. How are you understanding where you're at um, within that? So 
combining, as I put here, combines our beliefs and worldviews. And there are times I know I've had elders tell me that you can't be both, but for me, that's not a reality that I can accept. It's I am both. I'm raised as a Japanese by my mother, by matriarch. You know, my father's family were from the reservation started, came to Denver, you know, our whole family's there. Like I can't decide what I am. I just am. Right. So I think that that's just um, where I finally eventually got with my photo work. So that's how I've used these photos to kind of timeline, I think, like how I experience everything. So coming from the far east, um, and that our worldview doesn't hinder us or make us anything more or less, but we might approach something differently. We might look at something differently, um, but that, you know, we're all in relation and related to each other as well. So um, that's kind of why I did this photo series. Okay, so then going off of that, right, there's other identities that we have that aren't just like cultural, right? So I spent a lot of time looking at my cultural identity, right? But then there are other identities about being like musicians, right? And also being part of subcultures like metal, like punk, like emo. So I am a product millennial of the early 2000s looking at like you know, I think alt alternative rock grunge, like 90s grunge is still my favorite. Um, and then kind of getting into emo, getting into rock, getting into alternative, all those bands in the early 2000s, like were great, right? And I think for me, I was like the only person in all black, right? Like who loved this music. And being in Denver, like at the time, I felt like a lot of people, even in Lakota country, really loved hip hop more than I saw people who loved punk metal and rock, right? And rock and roll. Um, unless they were like classics or those biker dudes, like that was pretty much where it was at. Um, and I came to this like idea based on my friend Amanda's like Iron Maiden t-shirt where it's like, there is a whole metal genre, but then there's a whole res metal genre that is also not talked about. And something in 2018 that I think really sparked like, Vicky, when are you actually gonna do your metalhead project? You've been thinking about it since 2010, 2011. Um, and then in 2018, this happened. And this is when I finally just like was like, let's do this as a project as the next one about being Native metalheads. And when two Native American teens were stopped um, on the CSU, the Colorado State University tour, and I was in Denver at the time. So it's like it was big news. Um, you know, the parents said that they don't belong and that they were creepy and that they were suspicious. And she said they just stood out and they made her feel sick. And she said they were wearing all black and that they were suspicious, but the reality was they were actually wearing heavy metal t-shirts. They were in all black. And, you know, a lot of the time people were really looking at them as um, for their skin color, that they looked to be Mexican, that they looked to be brown, um, but they weren't really talking about, and for, she really commented on the black clothing, but no one mentioned that they were like metal, right? And that there was this idea of like what being metal how that also the identity also like sticks out in that way of wearing a metal t-shirt and then even this like t-shirt um the decapitated I forget their band name because I always have like these like amazing metal names I always forget but that band ended up giving these two these two teenagers like tickets for life um to their shows because they were wearing their shirt and got kicked out right but there's the solidarity from the metal community that was like really upset um, that I think that wasn't talked about, that there were a lot of metalheads that were upset that two kids were also in all black were called creepy and were seen as violent um, or that they didn't belong. And this idea of like you don't belong has been something that I think like in alternative music and even like even the core of heavy metal and rock was this idea you don't belong, you're so different and here's a community where you can all come together. Um, so I started following a bunch of um, res metal bands. I just found out who was a, just did a Facebook call, asked my friends, hey, do you know any res metal bands? And they introduced me to like Blind Drive, Suspended. This is all female. They're amazing. Like they, they're, they're like thrash. They like scream in a microphone. They do growls. Um, they're really heavy, hardcore, and most people underestimate them for that. Um, but when they perform, it's just like they're amazing. So I kind of started looking at these material clothing, how metal people are walking around, being a Native American, um, having res shows. So having these concerts and these shows that are on the reservation for the community, which is something I don't see, I didn't see in Denver. Um, 
growing up. <laughs> so it was like, this is something I would have loved to see as a teenager to see like native people my age, I think like rocking to instruments, learning how to play them and then learning how to like, yeah, compose songs and then share them in the community for free. Um, and most of the res shows, right, are drug alcohol free. They're open to the community. They're all ages. You'll see families come out with their folding chairs and sit and watch a concert. And I really like that because, yeah, this idea of the alternative subcultures of metal. So recently I went to the Navajo Nation Metal Fest. And what I like about Navajo Nation is, yeah, that's like a, they had a, like 100 bands at one point of like 150 bands, I would say, of just like res metal, different genres and different music. And where they would play is just like whether in border towns or um what they call like the real res metal shows are the ones that are kind of out on the reservation it's all diy do it yourself it's on a like a trailer um just like a trailer bed and then they'll put like speakers they'll put the concert out they'll shine their car lights on it and it's out in the dirt and it's a free show and that's what yeah i think that that brings community together and brings community together in a way that people don't think about to share music to share songs to share creativity with each other um, and I wanted to photograph it because the way that it's being photographed now, sometimes I feel like it's either um, romanticizes, I think what res metal is, but also really looks at the poverty again and really focuses, I think, on external hard factors of what the reservation is. But then when you look at what res metal is as well, it's also a sound it's a community, it's kinship with people and music, and it's people who just come together to release, of course, this emotional outlet, but also it takes place like, you know, it, it has no boundaries, which I like, right? And that's something I want to look at is what makes res metal res metal as a genre. And some of the things that they talk about will be about like language endangerment. It will be about missing murdered indigenous women. It'll be about language preservation culture. Of course, you can see those hints there, but then sometimes it's just about, I had a really bad day today and I'm gonna make a song about my bad day so that you can also like relate to it and just release that tension as well and those feelings. Um, and I think that's what I loved about this scene is just like how intergenerational it is, how everyone comes together. It's free. The ones that are not free, I think, yeah, I have I have ideas and critiques for sure. But the ideas of what it used to be is this free show. Everyone can come together. This is a safe space. And this is a time for us to be together. And I would say a lot of people are nostalgic um, for that. So the future of my project, which is like kind of the last one of of my slides is of course like traveling to different reservations looking at their metal shows but something that navajo nation did that i think is really exciting is they brought alien weaponry which is a maori um, band and they actually sing in their tribal language and sing in maori and also have haka within their metal songs and they actually don't always sing in english um, most of res metal in the southwest the navajo nation apache um, areas that I've been in and even Pueblo, uh, most of them will sing in English, um, but this band sings in, yeah, using their tribal language. I know there's some bands I've talked about trying it, but they found it really difficult, right? And of course, there's a lot of reasons for the difficult part of it, but that, mm, yeah, I, I don't think it's like something that's not being talked about or considered for the future, of course, but um, Navajo Nation had this band come and I think it's kind of gives this idea of like, if we're bringing in international metal together and it's the sovereignty of like, here's, um, of making new relatives more so, I think is kind of what I'm looking at is how, yeah, this is even going on to an international level. And Alien Weaponry even did an interview on the article that they say they always feel home. And this idea of feeling home on Navajo Nation, of being with other indigenous people loving this music, I think is like, it hasn't been really written or talked about or photographed in that way. And something that I know that like the tribal president also met Alien Weaponry, but even like the Savage Production folks mentioned like, you know, when they first met them, 
you know, they introduce themselves in Navajo and then they introduce themselves in their language in Maori. And I think that that exchange of like, um, of course, just language, but even just making, I think, new connections and this also through this love of this music, I think is like really exciting. So that's kind of where the future of my like photo work is going. So hopefully I know I had a lot of concepts and ideas in there. Um, my Instagram right now is actually Asian native, but um, yeah, if you wanted to send me an email or add me on Facebook, like you're more than welcome to. So um, yeah, thank you again, Pilamaye. And I'll do Q&A from here, Clementine. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. Um, we actually have some questions coming in on Facebook. Oh, okay. um, uh, Raya asked if you know of the social media accounts for some of the res metal bands. Um, I think people would love to know where to find them. Um, and then uh, Tosha had some really great, she, she had a comment about when she started at UCLA, um, she wore a lot of black and back then, and I'm sure even now there was a stigma that alternative people didn't go to prestigious universities. So I think she's just affirming um, those experiences. And then um, Tosha had a question about um, your thoughts on native TikTok trends. Um, and if you have any thoughts or questions about native TikTok. Honestly, I am actually not on TikTok. Um, so the best, let me get to some of the Res Metal um, Instagram accounts. The Res Metal podcaster is a really cool dude named Kelvin. And he's a, he's like a really like, he loves metal music, but loves like, uh, loves interviewing um, Res Metal bands. So if you go to his Instagram, his is great. Um, I want to give a big shout out to my other colleague, Christy Martinez, who's also at UCLA. She's also killing it in her PhD in musicology, looking at indigenous punk. Um, also includes, I think, the intersection of like indigenous punk and um, res metal. And our work definitely, I would say, collects together. Um, and her Instagram for hers is called the Indigenous Punk Archive. So I'm going to put that in here too, um, because you can also get recommendations here. And I love the indigenous punk archive because it's also the DIY of like creating your own archives of like where all these music is and how to share it and disseminate it. Um, so these are the two people I would always recommend first and foremost, Res Metal Podcaster, Indigenous Punk Archive. Um, Christy's work is amazing as well to uplift and to like just share, um, yeah, share music. Okay, and then the second question, TikTok. I don't know a lot about TikTok. I'm still just on Instagram mainly, so I don't know if I'm like old and outdated, but I'm not really on TikTok. But um, yeah, so I don't think I can answer that one too much. Stop share. Okay, chat. Um. Put yeah, do we that. have any more questions from our Zoom audience or um, people are just giving affirmations on Facebook? Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you for the recommendations. Um, yeah, do we have any questions from our Zoom audience? Nothing yet. Well, I have a question. Um, or here, here one. Where do you see yourself going from here? Yeah, so technically I'm still doing my PhD at UCLA. It's actually on res metal. So right now where I'm going with it is I want to actually remap um, res metal as an indigenous sonic resistance. So I'm looking at how to remap and reorientate the idea of what res means and what res metal means through sounds. Um, but through the music. And I think from here, I need to do my research, get my comps done, <laughs> do my interviews. Um, but part of what I want to do with Res Metal is I really love the oral histories of how people started. And I love how Res Metal started with like four bands. Um, and these four bands are kind of known as the Che bands, the grandfather bands. <laughs> and these like bands, of course, there's more than four of them. I'm sure the originals, but they're like certain ones that are really standing out, um, like ethnic degeneration, horny toads um, that are like sticking out. And even um, 
yeah, that are kind of like sticking out as like these are the pillars, right, of where Res Metal started. And then somehow the expansion of like a hundred um, other bands came out. Um, another band I really like, Grave of the Monuments. They recently have a song that's called Dying Language that came out that actually looks at, um, and I, I like, I know like a lot of scholars would hate the term dying language, but I like how this song kind of looks at dying language and kind of puts a twist and a metal spin on it, um, but also about how it brings back hope, right, to the communities and to bring back language to the communities. Um, so for me, like I'm looking at bands, I want to look at this timeline of like where res metal started, how it's understood through oral histories, and then how to remap the idea of the res, because in the res, sing songs, they or even those concerts, like say not on the reservation, to me, it's still a res metal show, right? And I think kind of pushing this idea that res is something that the reservation itself is a construct. Um, and something that was created. So I'm gonna be doing more photographs and I'm gonna be photographing bands, asking bands like how they, yeah, and looking at like how bands understand self-representation. So I'm hoping this summer, fingers crossed, I get to just travel around Navajo Nation and hang out with a bunch of bands, take photographs of how they would like to see themselves represented as res metal. That's not done through a white photographer because that happens a lot and it just ends up looking like, yeah, like National Geographic or something else like that. Um, so yeah. Um, we have some more affirmations just in that Josh says, woohoo, awesome stuff, Vicki. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I know. <laughs> um, or I also said just inspired what you, I'm curious what inspired you to do the research, which I think you touched on um, in talking about oral history and music. Um, I, I'm also curious about why do you think are, I guess, are there more res metal bands in the Southwest and why there's not more res metal here in the Northern Plains? Yeah, I have always wondered that too. Yeah. <laughs> right, we have more, I feel like we have more rappers up okay. here or like hip hop artists. Um, so I just wonder if you might theorize about those differences. Yeah, I'm still trying to theorize because yeah, in the Northern Plains, I always felt like the outcast of like, man, I really like... I love 90s grunge y'all like I'll be forever on 90s grunge and alternative rock and metal um but yeah I don't know yet that's something that I've always wanted to investigate and I love like somehow the southwest you know I think it's um I feel like the southwest itself like of course geographies environment um and there's just a lot of metal folks. Like even if you look at like people who tour, um, even metal bands are always making stops in Albuquerque, Farmington, because you'll always find a really big metal community support and culture. Um, but yeah, I don't have an answer to that yet, but I would hope to find, I think some idea of that, but I think that's what draws me to the Southwest. Yeah, I've heard of uncommon knowledge, yes. Yes, I have. I have not heard of nuclear decadence, but I have heard of uncommon knowledge. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I interviewed them actually. Yeah. That's great. Um, we have other, um, Araya also shared on Facebook, a lot of punk and metal bands visited um, for a long time, even high school shows. I feel like that helped a lot. Um, and Araya's in Southern California, but is also um, from the Southwest, so. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Soulfly, yep, Soulfly's on my list, yep, to come interview Soulfly, and like, they come to Navajo Nation. You know, I was supposed to go to Soulfly because they came to Los Angeles and the pandemic hit, but my advisors all wanted to go, <laughs> to go see them. But yeah, tribal metal, that's something that I also want to do. So looking at Alien Weaponry, Soulfly, and The Who. The Who also performed um, in the Southwest, but um, which I thought was really cool because they're Mongolian. So they're also like Mongolian indigenous. So that's something that I do want to do is look at, I think, these making of new relatives in that way through metal. Awesome. Well, I, I, it's just really exciting. You know, I'm also really keen on like the everyday. So I enjoyed hearing your reflections on um, 
that photography project in the beginning and um, and then thinking about the intersections of of your identities and um, and the kinship that you represent. So I really appreciate that. Um, we actually made it to uh, to the hour. Um, if there are any more questions, um, I know folks have other things to get to, but I really appreciate your sharing your experience and knowledge with us. And um, and if folks want to find these videos later. They'll be posted. I can't believe Vicky, I went live on my personal um, Facebook account instead of the racing mic five one. But, um, but Vicky's video will be available through YouTube, through Racing Magpie, um, in probably about a week when we get it uploaded. But are there any final comments or thoughts that you have? Yeah, and you all can always, um, yeah, can always email me if something comes up later. Cause yeah, I'm also that person where, yeah, uh, it'll be like an hour later and I have a question. So please feel free to email me and reach out. Yeah. And well, um, Ryan, like I also, you know, Vicky's in Los Angeles right now, finishing up her coursework. So I hope y'all can connect with her if you find her, if you're out in SoCal. Um, and then of course she always stops through and stays with me in Rapid City. So if folks wanna grab coffee with us the next time she's through, um, that would be great. But thank you all. And um, I'm gonna stop the Facebook live.